So just in case all of you don't read pharmacy and therapeutics on a regular basis, I guess you don't. Plus, it's, you know, it's this month's issue. Uh, just wanted to have a quick shout out to this particular article here, um, Time and Temperature Controlled Transport Supply Chain Challenges and Solutions by Claire Sykes, who is a freelance science journalist here. And why am I pushing this so much? It's because, where are we down here? Um, Delta cargo, tax breaks or not? No, wait, wait, wait. Um, here, so keep going a little further. There we go, advancements ahead. Um, Portland, Oregon based startup connected with Portland State University. And let's see, where is that? This virologist guy um, here who is said to know something about this. So. Um, again, quick shout out to this. I will be posting this on D2L as a connection. Another thing as far as D2L is concerned, a few people brought up that some of the slides that I presented last time, in fact, quite a few of them, are not in our textbook, at least not in this version. They're in previous versions of the textbook. So I will try and scan those and also post those to D2L so that you can have another way of looking at this particular subject matter. So um, we'll have a chance to look at that. Um, I also have scantrons over there in the corner. If you do go and get them, please be quiet as far as the rest of the lecture is concerned. So today um, we'll continue talking about bacterial transcriptional regulation, move on and just start to touch on eukaryotic transcriptional regulation, some of the broad brush pictures about what we know and a lot of what we don't know about eukaryotic transcriptional regulation and in the lectures next week, we'll talk about some specific examples, which are really just sort of supposed to be paradigms. So every one of the genes in our genome, 20 odd thousand of them, at least in terms of protein coding genes, are all regulated differently in different cells at different times. So um, there's no way we can cover all of them in this particular class. But last time we talked briefly about negative regulation. The whole point of negative regulation is it's about a repressor protein which binds to DNA, and in the case of bacteria, 99 times out of 100, that's going to block the binding of the RNA polymerase. No RNA bi uh, uh, polymerase binding to your promoter, no transcription. So that's a pretty straightforward mechanism, and this was the paradigm, the only one that was supposed to work. Again, Jacob Minot came up with this, and this was the only kind of regulation that existed. Um, as far as they were concerned. Of course, soon thereafter, we found that there was also positive regulation, which is literally just the flip side of this. So instead of blocking binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter, it's stimulating binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. And again, this can be presence or absence of a particular kind of ligand. So um, hopefully, all of you are going, well, okay, this really, all this is about where exactly that particular protein binds to the DNA. If it's going to be stimulating binding by the RNA polymerase or blocking binding by the RNA polymerase. And again, finally managed to bring my model this time. Uh, interactions, most of the time, major groove of DNA, alpha helix or two beta strands that are interacting directly with the base pairs there. But what this means is it's going to depend on exactly where that transcriptional regulator binds. Is it going to block binding of RNA polymerase? Is it going to stimulate binding of RNA polymerase? And not surprisingly, there are a number of proteins which do both. So you don't have a negative regulator and a positive regulator as separate proteins. One and the same protein can do exactly the same thing. So because this is the example, and again, I think this is something that's not in this version of the textbook, but in a previous version that again, I'll scan and try and post. Uh, the lambda repressor, and you know, repressor in quotes, which means that yes, in some cases it serves as a repressor, and in some cases it actually serves as an activator. So <clears throat> in this case, and again, we'll talk a lot more about this in virology next term, whole lecture on lambda. Um, the lambda repressor at some promoters binds right next to the minus 35 and minus 10 that the RNA polymerase binds to. And this actually stimulates transcription of one particular promoter. Exactly the same protein binds to a different piece of DNA 
that's one base pair different relative to the minus 35 and minus 10. And here it actually blocks transcription. So the lambda repressor is actually both an activator and a repressor. All that it depends on is where exactly it binds to the DNA relative to the promoter. And we'll see this also happens a little bit for eukaryotic systems as well. Um, the CAMP protein that I talked about briefly at the end of the last lecture, classic activator protein, can also serve as a repressor if it just happens to be binding on the DNA where otherwise the RNA polymerase would be binding. So um, these are <coughs> those systems, positive regulation, negative regulation. Um, and then we finally get to the LAC operon. And the LAC operon was this classic system, bacterial gene regulation, where we have Jacob Bonneau coming out with this wonderful system on how exactly gene regulation should work. And the way that the LAC operon works, it's a set of genes. So unlike the tryptophan operon that we talked about last time, where you have synthetic genes that make tryptophan, instead, in this case, we now have catabolic genes that are breaking down lactose. So lactose is present. The cell can't use lactose directly. It needs to break down the lactose into the glucose and galactose, and then it can use glucose for all the rest of the system. And so that's the basic idea. And here you have our gene. The connection here is still giving me trouble. Uh, this is the gene which is the beta-galactosidase, breaks down the lactose into glucose and galactose, so the glucose can be used. And it makes perfect sense here that in the presence of lactose, are you going to want to turn on this gene or turn off this gene? Turn it on so you can break it down. In the absence of lactose, you don't want to have it there. So you have a classic repressor, and this is the lac repressor, that now in the presence of lactose falls off of the DNA, in the absence of lactose um, sits down on the DNA because there's no reason for it actually to be expressed. This is exactly the system that Basically, Jacob Monod won their Nobel Prize for. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is how exact does the lac repressor fall off? Is it by binding to lactose, which, and I'll extend your question a little bit, changes the structure allosterically like what TRIP does with the TRIP repressor? The answer is exactly correct, but it's the opposite way that it works. So in the TRIP repressor, when it binds, then it will bind to DNA. In the lac repressor, when it binds to lactose, it comes off of the DNA. But it's the same kind of thing. It's actually a rearrangement of the binding helices in the helix turn helix. So yeah, so it's an extremely analogous uh, way. Now, of course, this was this is great. It was wonderful. Again, Jacob Monod got their Nobel Prize, and as a sort of probably misquoted Monod, there's no such thing as positive regulation, um, and. Soon thereafter, people actually found that, lo and behold, actually, even the lac operon was regulated through positive regulation. And that has to do with the extra level of control that happens here. So presence of lactose, you want to express these genes, right? Because you need to break down the lactose. Absence of lactose, you don't want to express the genes. But if you've got a bunch of glucose around already, do you want to spend that extra time and energy to make this gene to break it down? No. So it turns out that these genes are actually positively regulated by the CAP or CRP protein, which senses the absence of glucose. So in the absence of glucose and the presence of lactose, so again, lactose binds to the lac repressor, it comes off of the DNA, now you can get good transcription. In the absence of lactose, it's still crazy to make this gene because there's no lactose to break down. So it's only one combination of glucose and lactose. Absence of glucose, so you have the presence of this positive regulator, and the presence of lactose, which means you have the absence of the negative regulator giving you transcription. And again, the reason that Jacob Monod never noticed this is because they were always growing near E. coli in the presence of lactose, or the presence of glucose. So lactose, they were just changing lactose, but there was glucose around the whole time, so they only ever saw this top half. 
The other thing that I wanted to mention here, you'll notice that CAP or CRP is associated with CAMP, cyclic AMP. This is also one of those allosteric regulators, small molecule that will bind to the regulator. In this case, binding of CAMP causes binding of the activator to the DNA. Why is that? We're not going to get into all of the metabolism, but in low glucose, you increase cyclic AMP. Increase of cyclic AMP causes that activator to bind to the DNA. So, lac operon, completely clear. Everyone's happy with it? Yeah. Question? No? Yes? Thumbs up? Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I don't have a clicker question yet, but we'll get there. There are a few other ways that bacteria regulate their genes. I um, wanted to mention a couple of them, partly because on the next slide is stuff that I did my PhD work on. Uh, but <clears throat> also what happens in bacterial gene regulation are these things called alternative sigma factors. So I don't know if Dr. Bartlett talked about these alternative sigma factors in his lecture. Probably not. Um, so the sigma factor is basically the only general transcription factor that you find in bacteria. It's, you know, you don't have all of these TF to blah, blah, blahs. It's sigma factor. And the main sigma factor, which is used by E. coli, there are different names in different bacteria for this, is the sigma 70. Um, why 70? Because it's 70,000 Daltons. That's where it is on an SDS page gel. But there are lots of other sigma factors that you find in E. coli. And probably the most famous of these is sigma 32. Sigma 32 is a sigma factor that will bind to DNA together with the holoenzyme, but now not at normal minus 10, minus 35 consensus sequences, but at different promoter sequences. And it turns out that a lot of these promoter sequences were found because they were upstream of heat shock proteins. Like what? Heat shock proteins we talked about so far. HSP60, HSP70s, the heat shock proteins. And so these are regulated through the presence of this alternative sigma factor. So when heat shock happens, all kinds of interesting regulatory things that happen that we're not going to get into, the sigma 32 protein is made. That sigma 32 protein now interacts with the RNA polymerase. Instead of that RNA polymerase going to minus 10 and minus 35 consensus sequences, it now goes to the consensus sequences that that sigma 32 is going to recognize. And it turns out that there are lots of different alternative sigma factors which seem to be being expressed at different times while E. coli is growing, and particularly when we have different kinds of usually stress kinds of conditions that happen to the cell. Um, one of my favorites is this one right here, sigma 54. Um, involved in genes for nitrogen metabolism. And we'll see why I'm particularly excited about that one um, in just a second here. Another thing to mention is that in a fascinating, of course, viral system, um, you can see how the expression of, or transcription and translation of, sigma factors could lead to a signaling cascade. So your RNA polymerase, it has a normal sigma factor in it, it's going to bind to a normal promoter, and transcribe a gene for an alternative sigma factor, which will now reprogram the DNA, sorry, the RNA polymerase to bind to DNA in a different place, which could be making a different sigma factor, et cetera. And these are what are called sigma factor cascades, and it's a nice way of regulating temporally, because you remember it takes a long time between transcription and actually getting that active protein. So you can have a nice temporal regulation of different genes, which turns out to be really important for virus replication and other things as well. But then there's this interesting <clears throat> protein called sigma 54, again, an alternative sigma factor, um, studied uh, to a great extent by Sydney Kustu here um, at UC Berkeley. She was my PhD advisor. Um, and she was very interested in sigma 54 for a couple of reasons. The real main one is that sigma 54 polymerase, sigma 54 holoenzyme, Unlike the sigma-70 holoenzyme, once it binds to a promoter, it will actually go ahead and transcribe immediately. Sigma-54 polymerase just sits at the promoter and does nothing until it has some kind of activation event that takes place. And for a long time, people thought this was classic 
positive regulation, stimulation of binding to the promoter by the polymerase. But if the polymerase just sits at the promoter and does nothing, there's got to be something else which is going on. So that something else was NTRC, nitrogen regulatory protein C, mentioned before, sigma 54 is important for these nitrogen regulatory protein genes. And NTRC binds to DNA, but it binds to DNA hundreds to thousands of nucleotides away from the promoter that the sigma 54 polymerase is bound to. But it still works as an activator. How the heck can that happen? Well, through many studies, Sydney and her co-workers um, figured out that what was happening is the activator bound to DNA a certain distance away from the promoter, and then through DNA looping, this transcriptional activator then interacted with the polymerase. And once that happened, you had ATP hydrolysis, and this moved away from the promoter. What I'd hoped is that these extra dots here, which are not in the original figure, um, would be associated with this part of the polymerase, because that was part of my PhD work. I showed that it was a much larger complex. And you can actually see in the electron microscope this looping interaction taking place. That's the RNA polymerase. Here's the NTRC complex. You know, it's also as big as the polymerase, so we added these extra pieces here. Um, and then they form these loop structures. And this is what's absolutely critical for getting transcription to start. So now, this cis-acting element, usually again, all the stuff we've talked about so far in terms of bacterial regulation is right next to the promoter on DNA. This can now be a long distance away. And in fact, one of the things that Sydney and her lab showed was this can literally be thousands of nucleotides away. It doesn't have to be upstream of the promoter. It can be downstream of the promoter. And in one of the most elegant experiments, I think, that was done, actually put the promoter on a different piece of DNA than where the DNA binding site was for the activator and played this little trick where they had the DNAs that were connected to each other, but like a chain mail, just literally physically connected to each other, but no way that the, the binding site for your activator was on this piece of DNA, the binding site for the promoter, or the RNA polymers in this piece of DNA. When they're together like this, you had activation. When you separated them, they didn't activate. So that proved, I think, much better than an EM picture that they're interacting through looping through space. And yet, why am I spending so much time talking about looping through space? It turns out that eukaryotic activators do this almost exclusively. Yeah, Damon. Is, is looping through space just the diffusion, or what is actually mechanically? What's mechanically causing that loop to form? It seems to be mostly diffusion. And there's, <clears throat> oh, my pointer has now disappeared. Oh, well, here we are. Uh, that there's diffusion that happens, but then there's a protein-protein interaction which happens between the activator and the polymerase. And that is a strong enough binding that you can have them stick together. And that's 200 pages of double-spaced text and about 39 figures from my PhD thesis about that interaction. Yeah. Okay, so the, the question here is, is, is the binding, and I'll, I'll paraphrase your question here, and, and, and correct me if I'm not understanding your question, is DNA binding by NTRC specific, basically? Is it binding to a specific sequence? Yes, it's definitely binding to a specific sequence. And the only way then that, it, that that protein, once it's bound, can interact with the polymerase is because the DNA is flopping around. And so the NTRC is bound to its specific binding site, the sigma 54 RNA polymerase is bound to its specific binding site, and they can only interact through this looping interaction. And the protein protein interaction is causing a structural change in the polymerase? Exactly. So the protein protein interaction is causing a structural change in the polymerase, and that structural change is actually getting the open complex to form. So getting those two strands to separate like the helicase activity that you ever see with TF2H, but the sigma-70 polymerase already has to start with. Yeah. 
perfect question. We'll look at the next slide. <laughs> Great lead, and I didn't pay him off for this either. Oh, sorry, <laughs> we'll move there. Oh, what did I say NTRC stood for? Nitrogen regulatory protein C. So, and the sigma 54 polymerase is regulating these nitrogen metabolism genes. And if you're interested in more details, I can email you the PDF of my 200 page thesis. I wouldn't put that onto anyone, really. Um, so, yes, getting back to your question about DNA looping, um, isn't there an optimal distance for DNA looping? And we have, I, again, and this is one of the reasons I brought the model, look, it's nice and straight. Well, how can you have looping if you have a nice straight DNA molecule? And how easy is it to bend your DNA? And now we know from nucleosomes that you can certainly get this bending, but that's a really specific protein interaction which is happening there. This is not proteins in between which are helping this. And so just getting back to Damon's question about diffusion, if you think about this, there's going to be an optimal distance that these can be relative to each other because DNA can bend, but it can't bend completely. And so you're going to have an optimal distance. That optimal distance turns out to be almost exactly 500 base pairs because of the stiffness of DNA. And this is in the absence of extra proteins, and we'll talk about some of those a little bit later on. But about 500 um, base pairs away is optimal for these kinds of interactions. And this is what I basically said already. These enhancers can be you know, tens of thousands of base pairs away and even on um, different DNA molecules. Um, if you put something a little bit too close, it actually turns out it's harder then. If you got on 100 base pairs away, and that's why this curve comes down here, um, that actually it's harder to bend DNA completely because if we go back and look here, the interactions are basically on the top of this transcriptional activator at the opposite end of the molecule from the DNA binding site, which may be getting back to your question about binding to DNA and still being able to interact. So it's got to be able to flip over completely. So too close is not good. OK, so now finally we get to our clicker question, because that's it for bacterial regulation. Sigh. There's lots more we could do as well. Um, <clears throat> the lactose operon, the granddaddy of them all, um, is subject to negative transcriptional regulation, positive transcriptional regulation, regulation by DNA looping, both negative and positive regulation, or regulation by alternative sigma factors. We have yet to get 100%, so let's get there. Ten, five, four, three, two, one. We're still not 100%. Again, I'm sure that some of you are just trying to mess with my statistics. I, um, so the negative regulation of the lac operon is due to what? The negative regulation is due to the lac repressor. Positive regulation, CRP or CAP. I haven't had that much coffee yet either this morning, but still. OK, so <clears throat> let's start talking about eukaryotic gene regulation. And we're just going to talk about regulation by RNA polymerase 2. There's regulation RNA polymerase 1, RNA polymerase 3, and eukaryotic cells as well. But RNA polymerase 2 is what's transcribing all of the messenger RNAs, a lot of small RNAs as well. How is it being regulated? You have a promoter very similar to what you see in terms of promoters in bacteria as well. So the polymerase binds to that through the activity of the general transcription factors, you get open complex formation, et cetera. But how do you get this binding to take place and how do you get transcription to take place? Uh, turns out that it's way more complicated than in bacterial systems. But a lot of the same principles apply. We've got repressors, we've got activators, and then we've got a few extra things that go together with that. But the other thing is, like the lac operon, you have combinations of repressors and activators in order to get expression of individual genes. 
But it's not just one or two, it's usually 10, 12, 20, etc. And so this is a, oops, pardon me, uh, cartoon of what a normal, quote unquote, promoter looks like, and the so-called gene control region, which is around that promoter. So here's the Tata box, BRE, downstream promoter elements, et cetera. Here's our general transcription factors and the RNA polymerase. You have gene regulatory proteins that are bound right next to the promoter, but also lots of binding sites for enhancers that can be upstream here of where you're getting transcription, downstream here, and all of these guys together are going to regulate the polymerase. So it kind of looks like this, again, in a cartoon form. We'll have direct interaction of transcriptional regulators, but also lots of interactions through these so-called co-regulators and the mediator complex. We talked about a little bit, again, hopefully Dr. Bartlett talked about a little bit as well in his lecture. So large complex, multiple proteins, and literally serving as a mediator between some of these sequence-specific DNA binding proteins that are serving as regulators and the RNA polymerase complex. This gene control region, because you have these interactions with enhancers, and we'll hear later also there are silencers, which do the same thing, repress at a distance, only it's in a negative fashion. So this can be tens of thousands of nucleotides around where the promoter happens to be. And this makes it actually pretty hard to figure out exactly what proteins are involved in regulating one particular promoter because you can find lots and lots of them. How big is that piece? We, last time we talked about the electrophoretic mobility shift assay. That works great if you have a piece of DNA which is maybe 1,000 nucleotides long. You can't do that with 50,000 nucleotides or 100,000 nucleotides in order to identify promoters. So it's a lot harder to do these kinds of experiments. What you can do is figure out where all of these proteins, gene regulatory proteins, bind throughout the genome. And this is an ongoing process. And when I checked last night, we're up to 1.3 million regulatory sequences that are through the genome. We've got 20,000 genes. 1.3 million regulatory sites? How the heck do 1.3 million regulatory sites interact with 20,000 promoters? That's what we're still trying to figure out and why we're all going to have jobs, hopefully, for long periods of time because <laughs> there's a lot to still work on here. And just as a quick reminder, again, there are lots and lots of these regulatory sequences. There are also lots and lots of regulatory proteins, 5 to 10 percent of genes in our genome and most eukaryotic genomes, but they're present in very, very small amounts. Um, and so different amounts of these proteins um, and just small changes in them, and we'll see this a little bit later on, can cause big differences in terms of which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. Well, why should you care, other than the fact that it's going to be on a final in a couple of weeks? Uh, these transcriptional regulators, um, it was shown actually probably about 10 years ago, actually, like it's, oh, nine years ago. That's why I write these notes up here. 2009, um, the expression of four of these transcriptional regulators can cause differentiated cells to become stem cells. Now, you remember when we talked right at the beginning about DNA, all the cloning stuff, you had to take the nucleus out of one cell and put a new nucleus in. Um, and for Dolly and also for the monkeys that I showed, you have to do this hundreds of times to get one that works. Well, it turns out that you can take differentiated cells and now express certain transcriptional regulators in them and get those basically to become embryos. It's really amazing. And this was, again, almost 10 years ago now that this was shown to be the case that you could take two, four of these transcription factors. Every year it seems to be fewer and fewer of these. Um, and the Nobel Prize was given literally three years later for this. It's a very, very fast. Any follow Nobel Prize history? No, I don't either. But um, the three years is insanely fast for people to get a Nobel Prize. Um, Watson and Crick took, I think, what was it, 20 years, something like that, before they got their Nobel Prize. So um, that's um, one thing. Now, even more recently, this was, I guess, two years ago. Yeah, it was 2016 lecture. Um, now 
you can just inactivate one gene and it can turn skin cells into stem cells, which is really kind of amazing. This is actually a little bit out of date here. Sorry, this should be 1.3 million um, protein binding regions. So just a couple of trans gene regulators, expression of them in a different way, can cause cells to completely de-differentiate. But we still got literally millions of binding sites and thousands of different transcriptional regulators. So again, this is still a very difficult puzzle in trying to pull apart exactly what's going on here with all of these things. So what do these individual gene regulatory proteins look like? Um, a lot of this work for eukaryotic systems has been done in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, nice small genome, good genetics. So we learn a lot about eukaryotic transcriptional regulation by studying yeast. Um, one of those is the GAL4 gene. Um, this is a regulatory protein for galactose, so a, not at all dissimilar from the LAC operon in terms of turning on genes for metabolism. This has been very well analyzed, and we know a lot about how these genes particularly work. So in a normal e oh, sorry, yeast cell, I'm going to try and call it E. coli now, um, normal yeast cell, you have the GAL4 protein. The GAL4 protein is now known to be made up of two separate domains. It's got a DNA binding domain and an activating domain. Again, not terribly surprising that this is the case. The DNA binding domain is here, um, down at the bottom. Again, not surprisingly bound to DNA. And the activation domain is here. And this has been known for really quite a long time. Turns on this galactokinase gene through looping and interacting with activators here. But one of the big questions was, is this activation domain independent of the DNA binding domain. And so these are experiments that were done, no, again, probably about 10, 15 years ago now, where now, through the advent of genetic engineering technology, we're able to take these two domains and separate them from each other. And that separation allows you to have a activation domain, in this case for GAL4, bound to a DNA binding domain that actually doesn't recognize this DNA binding sequence here at all. It recognizes a completely different one. So now if you take this completely Frankenstein protein, again, DNA binding domain here, activation domain here, put it onto a piece of DNA that has a recognition sequence for the other DNA binding sequence, the promoter for the regular galactokinase, and now this so-called reporter gene. Now a reporter gene is a gene that normally wouldn't be in that particular cell and you're just interested in it being turned on when you have the appropriate conditions. This reporter gene turns out to be the LAC-Z gene. Does that sound at all familiar? LAC operon in E. coli, that's exactly that same gene. It's a beta-galactosidase gene. Yeast usually doesn't have a beta-galactosidase gene, so it's a different gene um, that is going to have activity now only if you can activate this particular gene. And it turns out that the way that you can activate this gene, just add a DNA binding site to get this activation domain next to, and again, next to can be literally thousands of nucleotides away, an enhancer, to the appropriate promoter. Now this gene is turned on. How do you know that it's turned on? Because this yeast cell now has beta-galactosidase activity, which otherwise would not. So through these kinds of experiments, it was first shown that activation domains are independent of DNA binding domains. And it really doesn't matter which promoter they're associating with. You just have to have an activation domain close enough to a gene that you're going to be regulating. And then people look at these activation domains. You know, what's going on with these activation domains? Well, it turns out that these activation domains are a whole bunch of different sequences. Um, and their main sort of unifying feature is that they're sticky. Sticky, okay, what do we mean by sticky? Well, if you think about it, how are we getting transcription to take place? We're having protein-protein interactions through this looping, and those protein-protein interactions are then going to get your RNA polymerase to the appropriate place. In your, <clears throat> in your uh, promoter, once you've got binding by all the general transcription factors, et cetera, then you can get transcriptional activation to take place. So that's this process. We talked about recruitment before when we talked about all the proteins that have to come together to get replication to start. Here, 
what we're doing is getting all the proteins together to get transcription to start. So we have activator proteins bound to enhancers, general transcription factors, the RNA polymerase together with all of its other general transcription factors, and now we'll have activation of transcription, but only when you're pulling all of these things together. So how do we get that to happen? It's through interactions between enhancer binding proteins and the mediator. You can also have enhancer binding proteins, activators, interacting with general transcription factors. Because you remember, we have to have interaction with the Tata box. We have to have interaction with the BRE. Once you have those general transcription factors, those can help bring in the RNA polymerase. So it's a lot of this stickiness, again, pulling in all of these appropriate proteins to get them to the promoter. One thing that you may have noticed in some of these cartoons is it's not always just a DNA binding protein that seems to be sticky. It's often another protein that's involved in this process. We talked about the mediator already. That mediator is a pretty general co-activator, co-regulator of transcription. It's usually present with the polymerase most of the time. On the other hand, there are a number of proteins that have been found to be absolutely critical for gene regulation that don't bind to DNA. Think, wait a minute, how does that work? We just said that how you're getting activation is you have stickiness, which is pulling the polymerase to the right place. How can you have something which is a non-DNA binding protein getting the polymerase to the right place. Well, the way that that works is because you have protein-protein interactions that will pull these non-DNA binding proteins to the DNA, and they're always going to be interacting with DNA binding proteins, and then you have activation that happens that way. So the definition of a co-activator or a co-repressor is going to be a non-DNA binding protein that will only associate with DNA when it interacts with DNA binding proteins that can then, through, again, protein-protein interactions, interact with the RNA polymerase at the promoter in order to get <coughs> transcription to take place. These co-activator proteins, again, just by themselves do nothing. They can only serve as activators when they're associated with DNA binding proteins. And just to make things confusing here, an individual DNA binding protein here shown as a heterodimer. So here's one DNA binding protein. Here's another DNA binding protein. This DNA binding protein can bind to DNA and interact with a coactivator, but that same DNA binding protein can also interact with a co-repressor depending on what other DNA binding proteins are right next to it. So we have all of these different combinations that can happen. And basically, you just have to study these experimentally to figure out which one is going to be which. So you say, I've got this great DNA binding protein, GAL4, interacts with DNA. Um, it's going to be stimulating transcription from promoters right next to it. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Kind of like the lambda repressor, where the DNA binding site is important for the lambda repressor, whether it activates or represses. Here, it's who your partner is is going to depend on whether you activate or repress. Sorry, your question? OK. <laughs> OK, the other thing is that um, we can get, uh, there's, again, another reference that I put in here to <clears throat> a review article where you can look at this. And then these mixing and matching, and we'll look at this a little bit later on, is that uh, presence or absence of some of these proteins can give you hundreds of fold regulation um, changes. Again, just presence or absence in terms of these different activators. So how does this activation actually work? So I've just always talked about now, it's just stickiness. It's bringing the polymerase to the promoter. This is great and wonderful, but what else is happening in eukaryotic cells that's different from bacteria? Chromatin remodeling. And what are those green things up here? They're nucleosomes. So nucleosome-bound templates. Big, big difference that we have between bacteria and eukaryotic systems. And most of the time, last time we talked about nucleosome breathing, where you can get interaction of individual proteins to nucleosome-bound DNA. But this 
pre-initiation complex, the general transcription factors, the RNA polymerase, the mediator, all these other things, this is big and way bigger than you're going to have in the space between individual nucleosomes. So one of the main things about eukaryotic transcriptional activation is you've got to get the nucleosome somehow off of the promoter. And there are a number of different ways that you can do that. Um, one of those is, you know, not surprisingly, interaction with these individual transcriptional regulators. Um, these can interact with co-regulators. They can interact with the polymerase itself. But also, you're going to have lots of interactions with nucleosomes from each of these regulators or co-regulators. So you can look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, again, the link is here. Uh, you can find it. I'll put the link up in D2L. Uh, here's just a process. Most of the time, your DNA is bound in nucleosomes. Then you have interaction by a transcriptional regulator. In this case, it's going to be an activator. And that presence of the binding of that activator opens up the piece of DNA from these nucleosomes. Then you have binding by the RNA polymerase, which is this red sort of arrow here. What's this? CTD, exactly the C-terminal domain. Other coactivator proteins, this green piece, this blue piece, they come together at the promoter. You have all of your binding that takes place. You have phosphorylation that happens on the CTD. You start to transcribe. Then you have more phosphorylation in the CTD. That's when the polymerase moves away from this abortive initiation state to the elongation state, eventually gets to the termination site, and this whole process goes on again and again. So that's the interaction, really, of the transcriptional regulator that's helping get the space around the promoter so you can have binding by the RNA polymerase to that particular site. Um, I mentioned before that usually it's about 500 bases that's optimal in terms of this looping interaction. That's 500 bases if you just have DNA, which is regular DNA. You can stimulate this looping if you have a protein that binds to DNA that bends the DNA. What protein have we talked about so far that is really good at bending DNA? TBP, exactly. TBP bends the DNA, and that actually helps bring a lot of these other DNA binding proteins together. So TBP helps bring DNA binding proteins together. And there are also a number of DNA bending proteins that will help get these binding proteins that are further away to the promoter. Uh, and I think this is one of the worst uses of zome that I know of, is the enhanceosome, um, where you have the enhancer, enhancer binding proteins, and all of your other general transcription factors, which can then lead to transcriptional activation. So DNA bending can also stimulate this formation of these pre-initiation complexes. Histones are not just present right at the promoter. They're also present in the DNA which is being transcribed. So the RNA polymerase has to be able to move these nucleosomes off of the DNA as it's being transcribed. But at the same time, once you've started transcription at one particular promoter, usually you don't want to be making huge numbers of copies of this particular piece of DNA. You don't want to be transcribing it to a great extent. So once the RNA polymerase has gone through, you actually want to stop more transcription happening from that particular promoter. How does this work? Through chromatin remodeling complexes and particularly having to do with methylation of histones. So we talked about methylation of histones. There are other proteins that will bind to them and help compact the DNA. So as the polymerase is going along, it carries with it a number of other proteins. How is it carrying them? And it's CTD, exactly. So the CTD is carrying along these extra proteins. That's what this little red blip here is supposed to be. The names of these proteins is not important, but these proteins then help remove the histones from here. And in fact, they will remove methyl groups and then once they've been removed from the DNA, they get put back on the DNA right behind the polymerase and get methylated. And so that's what all of these 
arrows are supposed to represent here, and just the amount of methylation which happens on histone H3, lysine 4. So we've talked about histone H3, lysine 4 before. Really classic and very well known. If it's acetylated, what happens? You get transcription. If it's methylated, you shut down transcription. So a lot of you are probably sort of going, well, Dr. Stedman, if you're talking about these things that can act at long distances away from each other, and we've got all these specific combinations that are important for regulation of one particular gene, how the heck does a enhancer binding protein here know that it wants to regulate this gene as opposed to that gene? And that's actually a really interesting question because they're interacting through looping. So, as I showed, told you before, you can actually have two different pieces of DNA and have the enhancer on one and the, the promoter on the other. How do we have these things separated from each other? Well, we talked about DNA loops when we were talking about chromosome structure earlier on. Turns out that there are proteins, and these are specific DNA binding proteins, that will specify loops and basically isolate those loops from some other activation which is happening from a distance. How exactly they work, we still don't completely understand. But this is the process right here. If you just draw out your DNA with a regulatory sequence, this regulatory sequence is supposed to be interacting with this particular gene. On the outside of the gene regulatory region are these insulator elements. These insulator elements bind to sequence-specific binding proteins that will make these loops. And what these loops do then is they mean that th anything that binds to this regulatory sequence is only going to regulate this gene. It's not going to regulate genes that are outside those insulator elements. And we'll talk about how they get regulated again a little bit later on. Not surprising that you can change the activity of this particular protein. We also talked about heterochromatin before, and one of the good or bad things about heterochromatin, depending on how you look at it, is heterochromatin is really good at spreading because of those feedback loops. Histone modifications lead to more histone modifications, lead to more histone modifications. You have to have barrier proteins or barrier sequences that will block that from moving through your DNA. So if you just look at where you have insulators and barrier proteins in a particular chromosome, that's shown down here at the bottom. So insulator proteins and barrier proteins are here in green. And all of the rest of your chromosome, it's actually polyteen chromosomes, so it's multiple chromosomes here, are shown in red. And this region right here would then be now the loop. The enhancer binding proteins that in interact with this DNA are just going to be able to be active on this piece. Enhancer binding proteins over here are just going to be able to activate this piece, et cetera. So this is the way that you can get enhancer binding proteins interacting with promoters that is only the correct promoter for them to be interacting with and not all of the other promoters throughout your genome. Yeah, Damien, you had a question? Yeah, so the, the question here is about loops. What, what we, and, and loops get used often. And sorry, the, hopefully I'm getting the question right here. Um, but the idea of the loop is you have a isolated loop of your chromatin. And that's what you're generating through these insulator sequences. Then inside of that loop, you'll have these activation loops where you have enhancer, enhancer binding proteins associating with all of the proteins at any particular promoter. That make more sense? Yeah, the back. Um, this might be off topic, but when people are trying to convert and build a replication site, and is it pulled equally, or does it work in a way that keeps the same competition through? Like, with all these complexes that form during transcription, does people trying to work around all of that extra stuff? OK, so that, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase your question here. And as it basically, where are the topo isomerases and what are they doing? <laughs> um, so there are two different things that happen here. So you, you clearly do, you're exactly right, you have a need of topo isomerase when you have transcription because you're pulling apart those two strands. They're coming back together as well, but you still need a topo isomerase for that. Those are actually going to be at the bases of these loop structures. So you have lots of topo isomerases here 
which can then help with that particular region. In terms of when you actually have replication, replication, you've got to pull the two strands apart the whole way through. And so when you have replication, you actually have to get rid of all of these extra loops because you're going to be replicating through all of them. But in general, those, and even there, if you think about where those topoisomerases are, they're usually at the bases of these loop structures. And even if you look at them in, in chromatin, you'll see them there as well. OK, more questions? Can I ask you a question now? See if we can get it to work this time? <laughs> if it will, yes. Which of the following has the most likely reason that insulators are required? DNA can bend, heterochromatin, euchromatin, enhancers, mediator. What the heck is he asking? Ten. Three. Lift off. We have lift off. Um, still not 100%. We're getting so close. Um, it's, it's, it has to do with the fact of enhancers. If you think about um, if DNA couldn't bend, then you wouldn't need um, these insulators because the only way things would work is if they were right next to your <clears throat> promoter. Uh, heterochromatin, what's blocking heterochromatin? Barrier sequences. So barriers and insulators are two separate things here. Um, euchromatin, the open chromatin, and the mediator complex, that's uh, just a coactivator. Had to have something for E, right? Okay, so the correct answer is D, yes. Question. I'm not sure I quite understand your question. I'll, I'll do my best to paraphrase it. So um, there are a couple things that I actually should be very careful about this. So you have an enhancer. An enhancer is a DNA sequence. So the enhancer binding protein binds to that sequence. And it's the interaction between the enhancer binding protein and the RNA polymerase which can help it to bind to DNA. Does that make more sort of answer your question? So it's protein-protein interactions that are really important here. And maybe I should have emphasized this more. We, I, if you remember that sort of the ball of yarn thing that I showed very early on in the, in the class, we had these protein-protein interactions and all the lines between the individual dots. Uh, that is why these are really important things to look at, because it's really about those protein-protein interactions which is giving you, in this case, the transcriptional activation. Yeah, so protein-protein interactions are really critical as far as it's concerned. Okay, so yes, protein-protein interactions are really critical, but <laughs> um, we still have this issue of chromatin and dealing with the <clears throat> fact that you can't get all of these proteins to the promoter if it's always bound to chromatin. So, how, is that? How do we deal with that? Our favorite chromatin remodeling complexes. These guys move nucleosomes around and basically allow you to get access to your promoter. And your promoter here is just shown as this um, ta-ta box. So chromatin remodeling complexes, what's really critical about chromatin remodeling complexes? They do what? They have a particular enzymatic activity, ATPase activities. These are ATP dependent. So 
AD dependence, they can move nucleosomes around. So that's what these chromatin remodeling plots are doing. They're really moving nucleosomes around. Uh, you can also mix and match your histones. We talked about histone chaperones before, where you can put in alternative histones into nucleosomes. Turns out some of those alternative histones are much better for transcriptional activation because they don't compact your DNA as much. You can also remove histones completely, and certainly removal of histones completely is definitely going to give you access to the Tata box. And then we have specific histone modifying enzymes, and we've hopefully talked about these more or less ad nauseum. Um, histone acetylases put acetyl groups onto mostly lysines. Histone methylases put methyl groups on. Methyl groups are usually leading to inactivation. Acetyl groups are usually leading to activation. So if you're thinking about opening up chromatin, allowing access to the Tata box, this is going to be histone acetylation, which is going to be very important here. So let's look at some of these chromatin remodeling complexes. A whole bunch of different families of these chromatin remodeling complexes. Uh, there are <clears throat> this whole family, the ISWI family, again, it's not important what these uh, are here, which is really important for putting nucleosomes together and making sure that in some cases you have a Tata box which is available. This is now this red box here. Um, activators, we're going to try and interact with this. Um, these remodelers now, the chromatin remodeling complexes, there are two major groups. There's the SWI SNF group and the SWR1 group. We'll see what SWI is important for later on. Um, SWI just stands for switching, for mating type switching. Um, and again, we'll talk about this more later on as a specific example. But these guys are either going to move nucleosomes along, again, in an ATP-dependent fashion, or they'll interact with these histone chaperones to remove nucleosomes completely, and you can then have the binding. In this case, it's actually um, an activator binding to a particular site, but you could also have the same kind of thing happening with a promoter. So, Histone remodeling complexes allowing DNA binding. And very often, this DNA binding, if it's the promoter, fine, you've got the polymerase. But here it could just be the binding by a transcriptional activator that will then lead to more chromatin changes um, elsewhere in your system. The S SWR family of chromatin remodeling complexes are really important for putting in these different nucleosomes. So how do these work. Again, we talked about the stickiness, but what are the different kinds of ways that you can get transcriptional regulation? The main one is one basically up here. We have stickiness of our DNA binding proteins. That stickiness can add to binding of other DNA binding proteins, which can then lead to binding of the polymerase. You can have binding directly to the polymerase. But you can also have these transcriptional activator proteins that will interact with a polymerase which is just sitting at a promoter. So this is a lot like what happens with NTRC. Now remember, NTRC is a bacterial system. But you also have very similar things happening in eukaryotic systems where you have the polymerase which is associated with the DNA. And with that polymerase, it's just sitting there. It's not activated. And usually that's because TF2H hasn't done its job. TF2H hasn't phosphorylated the CTD, hasn't gotten the two strands to come apart as through its helicase activity. So you can have transcriptional regulators that regulate this step of transcription. You can also have transcriptional regulators which are going to regulate paused transcription or abortive initiation. Hopefully, again, Dr. Bartlett talked about this, where you have the polymerase just sitting there, spitting out short RNAs, not moving from the initiation form to the elongating form. And that progress, and again, I probably should have brought up this slide again. If you think about the transcriptional regulation process, you have binding to the DNA, you have closed complex formation, you have open complex formation, you have abortive initiation, you have elongation. Each of those steps can be regulated, and each of those steps is regulated by various different transcriptional regulators. 
So let's finish up a little bit on how, a little again, a little more detail on how some of these things work. Um, this is <clears throat> an example of a, uh, sorry, it's a little hard to see here, um, a transcriptional activator. This transcriptional activator is going to act in a indirect way in order to stimulate, in this case, closed complex formation. How does that happen? This transcriptional activator, the enhancer binding protein, interacts with an enhancer. But then what does it do? It has protein-protein interactions with a histone acetyltransferase. What do histone acetyltransferases do? They put acetyl groups on histones. That acetylation first makes a difference just because of a change of your charge and then pushes the DNA away. But much more important is the interaction with other proteins that now will recognize that acetylated histone. And acetylated histone basically says, hey, this is a place where we want to get transcription to take place. And that interaction, in this case, turns out to be with TF2D. So TF2D interacts with these proteins and the modifications that happen to the histones. Once you have TF2D bound, now this will help you bind to TF2B, TF2E, TF2F, and the rest of the polymerase. And also the chromatin remodeling complex will associate with these modified histones in order to move those histones back and forth, push those histones off, just as we talked about on that last slide, in order to get, again, the, the main thing here is it's just removing the histones, getting the histones away from your Tata box and getting your pre-initiation complex to be formed. And so this is that mechanism. You have a transcriptional activator, enhancer binding protein, interacts with this histone acetyltransferase. What would you call that histone acetyltransferase? Pardon? Changing chromatin, but it's, a, it's an activation protein that's associated with the DNA. Does that histone acetyltransferase interact with DNA directly? No. But it's activating transcription. What would you call it? A co-activator. So many, many, many of these co-activators are histone modification enzymes or chromatin remodeling complexes they will associate with the sequence-specific DNA binding protein, which is your enhancer binding protein, and then stimulate transcription through this different activity. Yeah? The co-activator is responsible for forming euchromatin. In this case, it's, yeah, it's, so what's the, you know, responsible? They're only going to be there because they have interactions with the sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, the enhancer binding proteins. But then once they're there, that will recruit, again, through protein-protein interactions, to that part of the DNA and cause the formation of euchromatin after that. Okay, just finish up with some really bad math. <laughs> one, plus two, one plus two equals 100. <laughs> um, basically, all that this is says that these transcriptional activators act synergistically. So if you have one transcriptional activator, it's going to give you a certain amount of transcription. If you have two, it's going to give you a different amount. You put the two of them together, you get a whole lot more. Um, and that has to do with all kinds of different DNA binding, stimulation, et cetera. But this is really how you can go. And we talked about the cooperativity before. Binding of one gives you this curve, which is not a very steep on-off switch. Binding of many and activity of many will give you a much sharper transition. So you're really turning things on and turning things off. So we'll talk more about regulation uh, later on on Monday. Have a good weekend. <laughs>